Good evening, everyone. My name is Ramel Mustafa. I'm a faculty member and the director of the Lawrence National Center for Policy and Management at IB Business School. On behalf of the center, the Ivy Academy and the Ivy Alumni, Alumni Network Ottawa chapter, a warm welcome to you to this special virtual Farsight chat entitled New Year's Revelations Contemplating the Canadian Economic Playbook for 2021 and Beyond. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that 2020 was a year that tested our resilience and adaptability, but what does this new year have in store for Canada and our future prospects? To discuss our economic climate, policy priorities, and what it all might mean mm -hmm. for Canada's long-term prosperity, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Stephen S. Poles, Chair of the Lawrence National Center's Advisory Council and former governor of the Bank of Canada. Stephen has 40 years of public and private sector leadership experience in financial markets, forecasting and economic policy. During his tenure as the governor, Canada was consistently ranked at the top among OECD countries in macroeconomic stability. In the early days of the pandemic, Steve led the Bank of Canada's proactive monetary policy to swiftly restore confidence in our financial systems a precondition for economic recovery. Now I could spend the entire session speaking about Stephen's uh, accomplishments, but let me here just point out that Stephen is also a proud alumnus of Western University, earning both his master's degree and PhD here in London, Ontario. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks Ramel, happy new year to everybody. Steering the conversation this evening is Paul Wells, senior writer for McLean's uh, Magazine and former national affairs columnist at the Toronto Star. In more than two decades on Parliament Hill, Paul has covered eight federal elections and four prime ministers. I could also go on and on about Paul, but let me here note that Paul is also a graduate of Western University and a Lawrence National Center fellow. A warm welcome to you, Paul. We're all- Thanks for having me. We're all eager to hear from the both of you. So Paul, over to you to kickstart the session. Mm. Uh, thanks, Ramel. Uh, welcome to everybody who is following us. We've got quite a, a hefty audience and that's always gratifying. Um, and I'm happy to have uh, such a distinguished guest as Steve Polaz uh, so early in the new year and with so much about to ha start happening. I mean, uh, we're about um, 10 days before Parliament is scheduled to return. We're about a week before uh, the inauguration of a new U.S. president. We're about a week past one of the most uh, chilling spectacles of, uh, of uh, anti-democratic uh, protests that I think any of us has ever seen on, on Capitol Hill uh, to the south. Uh, and we're in absolutely in the middle of, of this pandemic. Um, I don't know whether the Ontario government would uh, would classify our chat as a, uh, a, 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 a necessary activity or a, you know, but fortunately we can do it while while staying home. So uh, we're we're on we're on the side of public health uh, uh, regulations uh, with this conversation. I will uh, I will note that. Um, for everyone who has registered to watch this, a recording of this conversation will be sent to you afterwards. Uh, so you can uh, you don't have to furiously take notes uh, uh, while we're talking. And I would encourage everyone uh, to uh, type questions that might occur to you in the chat. Uh, we will of course not get to all of them, but I will see uh, uh, several of your questions at least and, and we will get to a selection of those. Um, Stephen, I thought we would start by talking about uh, the recovery. I, everyone is so uh, eager to have a, a recovery to get to get past this extraordinary crisis, and I thought I would ask for your thoughts on 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 the the characteristics of this recovery. Um, there's a sort of an alphabet soup of possible models for recovery: W-shaped, K-shaped, V-shaped. What do you think this recovery is going to uh, look like? How would you characterize the recovery path so far? Well, even today, Paul, uh, we're off to a rough start for uh, for the new year, and uh, so it's almost uh, it almost feels odd to be talking about the recovery when we're in the middle of the second wave. 
Um, but I, I think we have a reason to be optimistic uh, that 21 will be better than 20. Uh, we're deep in the second wave, uh, as, uh, as everybody knows. The economy, I think, therefore, is very likely to form a W. Uh, economist parlance for the double dip. Uh, although the second half of the W may not be as significant as the first half was, given what we've learned uh, in the in the interim. Uh, but anyway, it'll be shaped like a W. I think that's that's clear. Uh, but then I expect the economy will demonstrate again, as it did this past summer, uh, it'll show us the form of a K as we exit the second wave. And uh, the reason the K is uh, insightful is uh, we have basically two parts to the economy. Uh, the top part of the K, which is, by the way, the majority of the economy, has recovered very nicely from, uh, from the shutdowns of last spring, uh, basically formed a, a V, you know, uh, so into your letters. Uh, it's a very sharp V-shaped recovery in the top part of the K. The bottom part of the K, we've got the hard hit sectors like uh, travel and tourism, uh, related businesses, hotels, of course, restaurants, bars, and uh, in-person retail, uh, obviously uh, air travel, I've mentioned uh, travel in general, and of course in the oil sector, we've got some, uh, some stresses there. So some of these effects could end up being permanent. In other words, the bottom part of the K could persist uh, quite a while. So for instance, my guess is we'll have less business travel overall now that we've discovered how well uh, virtual meetings work, less commuting, uh, less, you know, on average in a given workday, even when everything's over, I think there'll be fewer people at the office. Uh, less in-person retail also seems likely. And of course, from these things, those permanent effects, there'll be attendant uh, spillover effects on small businesses, especially in downtown cores. I think it's important to keep things in perspective. We hear a lot of dire stories, uh, but a couple of numbers. On GDP basis, the economy is pretty well 97% of where it was last February. Uh, that's pretty much of a recovery, isn't it? The jobs, if we measure by jobs, same thing. We're about three percentage points short of the number of jobs that we had last February. Uh, and indeed, retail sales in November were already 4% higher than they were last January. So a very dramatic recovery in spending. So it may look like a recession on paper and to economists, but actually it's quite different from that. It's important for us to understand the differences. And the reason is because incomes were very well sustained by targeted government policies. So looking forward to the true recovery as vaccines spread uh, I think there's bound to be a relief boom, just like after 9-11. Uh, there sure is some pent-up demand out there. Uh, it won't be an unlimited boom. It'll just be, uh, a, a, say, maybe a boomlet is more appropriate. Um, but it's not as though you're going to catch up to where we were all the way. You're not going to go out and order four steaks in your first restaurant meal to catch up. Uh, so, uh, so some of those things just never will catch up. But I think uh, we've reason to be optimistic as we look forward. Okay. When you talk about the K-shaped recovery and, and this, essentially the in-person economy of travel and tourism and uh, show business, nightlife, uh, um, things like that, um, is, is the recovery there simply going to be a little delayed, basically until people feel safe being out among, among uh, others? Or is, are, you, are you really talking about lasting effects, that that, that that part of the economy is unlikely to bounce back, at least by itself? Well, it's, it's important to start the answer to that with uh, being honest, we really don't know. Uh, at this time of year, especially, people hope the economists will look into their crystal ball and give them the answer. By the way, I do have a crystal ball right here, okay? <laughs> Just, I'm looking at it right now. But, but importantly, I do think that there are, there's enough evidence around us now that some of those things will be, will be permanent. I think permanently work, work arrangements will change permanently. That doesn't mean you'll never go to the office, but you may be sufficiently flexible that on a given day, uh, let's say for sake of argument, two thirds as many people go to the office as used to on a given day. So that's less demand for commuting and that sort of thing. And it means that there's fewer people every day in the downtown core to go and have lunch and that sort of thing. So there'll be some effects, I think, from those things. But in, you know, in retail space, we know a lot of the 
things that we buy online now, well, we're just going to keep buying them online. But there's lots of things where the personal experience of, of shopping is still very highly desirable. And so none of this, what we see is permanent, but I think parts of it will be. But I think understanding the K is mainly about understanding that the economy will be on two tracks. When, when you know, a fast track and a slow or really sluggish track. And when you add it up, it'll look like a slow jobless recovery overall. But actually, it'll be pretty hot in the top part of the K and, of course, cold in the bottom. And that would help us understand, for example, why the stock market it can behave like it is. You know, the median stock has underperformed the indexes. Well, that's because lots of stocks in the bottom part of the K have been beaten up and they've only recovered partially. The techs and the other things that are guaranteed to benefit uh, from this new world have boomed. Um, you know, you can see it in the housing market. The housing market is primarily uh, being driven by low interest rates. Uh, there's also some, some, some pent up demand, but mainly what we've got is a good strong baseline immigration rate, which keeps adding to demand every year. And municipalities really aren't permitting enough new housing to accommodate that. So I think the housing market is well uh, supported. And uh, I probably should mention one other thing, Paul, and that is that throughout this, our banks have done a lot to help people manage the stresses uh, associated with the pandemic. And, um, and so, you know, you could have predicted some major damage to the housing market if people lost their jobs and had to, after a couple of months, had to sell their house. Um, I think there's been very little of that, and that's, that's because of the, the flexibility that the system permitted. And so for that reason, plus the, the upside on housing, we've got a pretty solid situation. Okay. How about inflation? I, I know, you know, 10 months ago when, when we were just beginning to track the parameters of this particular mess we were all in, there was talk about the possibility of deflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it looks like there are some drivers of inflation uh, appearing in the market. What do you think is going to happen on that front? Well, um, look, this, is a, this, is a, this is a hard question because we're not really sure how the macro economy is going to sort itself out. For sure, whenever there's a major contraction in the economy, like we had last spring, I mean, GDP measured on the monthly basis ended up falling by 19% during uh, March, April. That's a pretty big decline in the economy. Uh, thing is, it, it came back, as I said before, it's, it's already back to like 97% of where it started. Uh, but at the time, it, it looked so big and you didn't know how things were gonna turn out. Uh, that the first fear that goes through the marketplace is falling inflation. And since inflation was already fairly low, like it was around 2%, but that, that just means you could, you could enter a deflationary episode if it lasted a long time. Uh, at the time, we were getting all those articles about how it's the worst contraction since the Great Depression, which is a really false comparison, but that's the sort of thing that adds to that fear because, of course, we had a big uh, deflation during the Great Depression. Measured inflation fell sharply right at first. It was mainly about gasoline. Prices of hotels and airfares fell too. Uh, but I like to look at the Bank of Canada's core measures. Uh, they're sort of 1.5 to 1.9%, so not that much below two. Um, I think uh, as we go forward, it's a question of demand versus supply. We know demand is a little below where it was. Uh, supply is probably adjusting. Every time a firm decides they're they're going to exit, that reduces uh, supply. Uh, but I think the point is it's not our typical situation of excess supply because the, the well-targeted uh, fiscal policies are, are supplementing incomes at a time when demand would be really low because you've lost your job. I think the, the market, what's more interests me more is the longer term outlook in inflation and whether that could be an, up, an uptick in inflation, you know, longer term. And that's usually about the combination between high government debt and the temptation to somehow, you know, inflate that debt away. Uh, that's, I'm not, I don't, I mean, in a global context, there may be countries that, uh, that think that way. And uh, there's lots of what we call opportunistic politics going around that could interfere with central banks. And also, as you mentioned, some cost push, push inflation effects. Things like deglobalization, right? Boost prices uh, at the same time as reducing employment growth. So you kind of get a stagflation effect from deglobalization. So all those things kind of combined means that, you know, 
Personally, I think the most likely outcome is we're just going to get inflation to go back to around 2%, and it won't be that long uh, uh, before it is. Um, but the risks of a global inflation outbreak farther down the road are higher than we've seen in the last 30 years, given this unusual starting point and the confluence of debt and politics. Okay. While I'm on it, I see one interesting question in the in, in, in the chat, which is, how robust is that rosy top leg of the K? Is that a real economy or is it a small number of, uh, of essentially tech firms mm -hmm. that are making such a fantastic killing that, that, it, that it looks like a whole sector of the economy when it really isn't? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's somebody who, who looks through often through the lens of, a, of the stock market, which I think is, is a valid interpretation. Um, if you, like I said before, if you look at the median stock, it hasn't done that well. Uh, so the market, it, it could be that, uh, the, you know, market indexes are not really telling us the macro story. And that's why you think of this disconnect. But I don't think there's a disconnect as long as you understand the K and disentangle the effects in the market. But uh, the GDP number I mentioned, which is, uh, you know, most of the way back, that's, that's just not, that's not just measuring the tech sector, it's measuring everything. And it's across, you know, the vast majority of the economy. If we look at jobs, uh, virtually the, we're, we're, you know, we're something like 600,000 jobs short of where we were. Uh, so as I said, about 3%. Um, and it's almost all in, uh, in that uh, hospitality, in-person uh, sectors that you talked about before, uh, which by the way, historically are high turnover sectors, you know, so, how often you walk down the street and you say, oh my gosh, that restaurant is closed. I, I used to, I hadn't been there for a while, but it's closed. And then uh, a couple of weeks later you go by and what, what what's there but another restaurant. So you kind of get this high turnover in that sector. And some of the people that used to work at that restaurant may end up working at it again, even though it's a different restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my, my sense is that uh, those kinds of areas will bounce back when the time is right, but that doesn't minimize the amount of pain that's going on now, you know, in the in when we're still in the shutdowns. Um, another issue that's uh, attracting a lot of attention, of course, is mounting fiscal debt, the, the, the extraordinary amount of spending that governments and especially the federal government have engaged in. Um, total federal spending doubled last year. That's never happened outside of wartime. Uh, and, and a lot of people are wondering whether we're creating a debt burden that's going to be difficult to carry or correct over the longer term. What do you think? Well, uh, everybody's right to be concerned about that. We all should be, for sure. But uh, we, again, let's uh, put it in perspective. I mean, top line, you're, you're right. Globally, uh, uh, government debt is forecast to exceed 100% of GDP, global GDP, uh, by well, this year, very soon. That's up over 20 percentage points from a year ago. So that's, that's a huge move, as you say. Um, Interestingly, that's the same level of global debt that we had just after World War II. And uh, through the last few months, I've been, when I, as I bump into people, not many people, but usually online like this, I've been asking them, uh, do you remember, like when you're, if they're my age or thereabouts, I ask them, you know, do you remember growing up in the 50s and 60s, growing up under the debt burden that your parents left for us after World War II? And I haven't found anybody yet that remembers any discussion about that around the dinner table uh, as they were growing up. And uh, so what happened then? Uh, basically, we grew out of it. We, you know, we never really paid it back, per se. What happens, the economy got way bigger, so it didn't matter in terms of the stock of debt anymore. Um, here in Canada, we have a better situation than the global one, but it's important for us to combine provincial and federal debt together. In that case, you know... Uh, it's not. Uh, it's a little less comforting, perhaps, than it is just if you look at the federal level. But the main thing is that we have really low interest rates. Uh, debt service today, as a share of GDP, is about a fifth of what it was in the mid 1990s when we last had some tensions around uh, debt and our fiscal situation here in Canada. And the actual formal criterion uh, for this is that uh, economic growth needs to exceed the rate of interest. In order to then, what that what that means is, if economic growth is faster than the rate of interest, 
then the base, the, the, the base that you're taxing keeps growing faster than your interest payments. And so gradually your debt declines as a share of GDP and your ability to finance it. And uh, so you ask yourself, can we get, uh, uh, so right now let's say interest rates you know, are pretty low, but say they even they got to be 2% on a bond yield, uh, we can have uh, 2% inflation, of course, and so if we had 1% real growth, we'd be eroding the stock of debt relative to, uh, to our economy. And uh, that doesn't sound very hard to do, does it? I mean, really, uh, in fact, I think we can do far better than that. We can't take it for granted. So I think we should be doing everything we can to boost the growth trend line uh, so that we can grow out from under this debt burden faster. But I think it's conceivable that we could do it all without actually raising taxes per se. You just focus on policies that add to growth. I mean, my favorites are things like uh, universal daycare, uh, which would increase labor force participation by women, and uh, trade liberalization between the provinces, which is a well-established empirical result, but that costs us money every day. Fixing a couple of things like that could add, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 percentage points onto growth every year. And uh, that's free money that we might as well have to help us pay our debt. It's interesting. I you talk about um, uh, earlier about the disconnect between uh, people who watch the stock market and people who look at, you know, kind of the rest of the economy. Um, I've been noticing a disconnect between uh, some of my colleagues who write about the economy and uh, academic uh, economists and people involved in running the, the, the monetary system. Some of my colleagues are just absolutely in a tizzy about the amount of spending and they say it's just not going to be sustainable. And I have actually have a hard time finding an academic economist or somebody who's been in a position like the one you held, who who would argue against the the, the broad outline of the of the actions the government has taken. Somebody needed to take on a lot of debt to bring in the economy for a landing, and the the entity best place to do that was the just because of the the the, the nature of the conjuncture a year ago it was the federal government. I, would, would would it be fair to say that you? Um, broadly don't disagree with the, the, the direction the federal government has taken over the last year. No, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with it. Uh, look, it's, it's, it's as if uh, a bomb has gone off in our economy, Paul, and there's, there's a gigantic crater in front of us. And uh, we had choices. Um, one choice would be to just uh, let markets work and uh, go for a walk down into that crater and walk across the bottom of it and then climb our, our way out the other side. Uh, that's one possibility, and that would have been a recipe for the second Great Depression. Uh, we would have lost a lot of firms, people would have lost their homes. Uh, we would have had deflation and all those things. We're smarter policymakers now. We're not, not gonna allow something like that to happen. And, uh, and so I think uh, the, the notional thing that's going on is filling that crater up with money uh, so that we can uh, row our boats across it. You know, uh, it's liquidity, right? So you can row your boat across a big crater full of liquidity. And uh, once we get to the other side, then you can ease up on all those things and you're back into economic growth. The stock of debt will be large, just like after a war, like after World War II, of course it will be. But I think a story, historical precedent tells us that, you know, it's what's our ability to service it, to work, to pay taxes and grow the economy uh, is what matters. It's not the stock that matters. Just as when you get your first mortgage, the stock, you know, kind of matters psychologically. But provided you have the income uh, to support it, then you're going to pay for it. It's going to take you 25 or 30 years. Well, okay, that's that's a whole generation, isn't it? So I, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm hard I'm not hard pressed to get fussed about this. Um, I think that we, uh, the main thing is for us to focus on boosting growth. We've had lots of opportunities to do that in the past and we really haven't done them because they seem to be politically difficult to do. And I'm hopeful that in this context, we find ourselves that we can have more of the kind of collaboration, especially federal provincial collaboration that allow us to do some things uh, that will boost growth forever and, uh, and really help us get out of it. We, we, we certainly have every reason to do so. Okay. Reading between the lines of what you've been saying, it sounds like the, the, the kind of growth that we need uh, to make that debt, which is large in dollar terms, to make it recede 
in proportion to the economy is, is growth that's long-term and growth that's inclusive. And I suspect that you've been giving both of those elements a fair bit of thought lately. Yes, I have. Um, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> the thing is we've got a pretty persistent and an important uh, undercurrent in the economy, which is technological change, technological progress. And you can see it all around us. And there's every reason to think that the pandemic has accelerated some of the deployment of that. Um, Arnold Harberger some years ago, I guess it must be about 20 years ago, uh, gave this fantastic talk uh, where he talked about the benefits to society of technological progress. And we all envision it kind of like yeast, that you know there, it spreads all around and everybody gets some. But in fact, uh, technological progress creates these, these uh, benefits that pop up more like mushrooms. And so what happens is not everybody gets some. In fact, uh, you know, the, the, the tech heavies, you know, are able to pluck whole mushrooms and, and take it all and become really big companies and so on. And so it doesn't spread around as enough as it should. So in short, historically, what we found is during industrial revolutions or big moves in technology, we get an increase in income inequality. And that produces discontent in the general population. And I think it's that layer of discontent that opportunistic politicians are tapping into. Now, they could just come to office and work towards a more redistributive tax system, you know, with things like guaranteed minimum incomes or taxing the, the, the high paid folks in favor of those who uh, get paid less. But instead, what they tend to do is they blame something else that they can manage. You know, doing that, uh, doing something on income redistribution is politically hard. It's easier to bash China or disrupt international trade, which is total nonsense. Uh, the point is, though, that unless we do a better job of making growth inclusive, we're going to continue to experience these kind of unusual political volatility in our business environment, and that's not good for growth in any way, shape, or form. So as we, let's take a few minutes now to focus on these notions of long-term and inclusive growth. As we do that, uh, it's clear that Canada has um, some really strong uh, structural advantages. Uh, you know, a decent fiscal uh, uh, picture, uh, institutional uh, stability, um, which especially after the last week is looking like a just a, a heck of an advantage. But it, uh, Canada also has some uh, weak spots that could um, could stand some work. How would you map those uh, those uh, strengths and those weaknesses? Yeah, well, that's that is a big uh, that's a, a really big question. Um, I mean, to start with, economic growth comes basically from population growth and technology. And starting with those basics, every country has differences, right? They're, they're, in, they're basically in competition with one another uh, to, to generate their growth or to get their, their share of global growth. Having the ingredients available is not sufficient, even though it might be in an economist model. A lot of economic growth is pretty mobile, especially today. It can go wherever it wants to. So each country has its own foundation, as you're mentioning, to work with. The, the natural resources come immediately to mind. Uh, that confer, they, they confer a natural competitive advantage on Canada and always will. You know, but way better to have a country with natural resources than one without. But from there, you have a set of pillars, if you like, of, of, that are kind of like a, the, the, the supports for economic growth that are your own design. They contribute to the competitiveness or your ability to generate economic growth. So these are things like things we take for granted, educational system, medical care, uh, the financial system. You mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned the fiscal situation, so macro, the macroeconomic uh, stability. The international trading system is a really piece, important piece of this. Uh, infrastructure of various forms, all those kinds of things. So this is exactly where uh, the folks at the Lawrence National Center are focusing. Uh, how do we strengthen those pillars, um, you know, uh, to unlock Canada's natural competitive advantages? So this is where we do need some focus. Our trend uh, growth performance has not been the best uh, in recent years. In fact, it was in decline long before the arrival of COVID. Uh, the OECD does some good comparative work, you know, uh, ranking countries on various. Uh, various criteria, well, if in effect these pillars, it's a very useful set of metrics. And according to their work, 
uh, Canadian strengths, as you've mentioned, you know, macroeconomic stability, financial systems, our institutions in general, very solid stuff. Soft spots for Canada would be things like physical infrastructure. I mean, uh, they're, they're almost all are infrastructure of some kind, physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, uh, trade infrastructure, and social infrastructure. I mentioned before, like daycare. So all of these need some investment uh, if we're going to boost for real that long-term growth trend line. If only there was a national uh, um, uh, center at one of our major universities that was focused <laughs> on uh, the very uh, types of, of infrastructure development that you just mentioned, yeah. maybe, maybe that could make a real contribution to our national discussion at this time. It sure would. And that's, of course, exactly the, the space that uh, Lawrence National Center occupies. And, uh, and uh, we would like to see ourselves as a focal point for that conversation whether it's with uh, with, act, with business leaders or with uh, with the policymakers, um, and of course bringing together the academic heft and our alumni network, that's a pretty powerful uh, place uh, to be. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's that's exactly where we need to make some fundamental improvements. And now, uh, of course, upcoming in the next uh, little while, they'll be developing the next. Uh, budget, the federal government parliament will be back in 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 a, in a couple of weeks, and they'll be uh, busy at work on a budget. And uh, the main focal point will be what are we going to do to kickstart the economy as we exit the pandemic, and not kickstart in a quick growth kind of context, but in boosting the growth trend line, as I'm saying. So it's a good opportunity. It's a good time for for folks to have input into that uh, into that uh, conversation. Now, you mentioned physical infrastructure, which is pretty easy to grasp uh, conceptually, roads and bridges and ports and, and, and so on. Um, but you also mentioned trade infrastructure and digital infrastructure. Right. Um, could you give us a kind of a, a fuller understanding of what that entails? Right. Uh, what Canada's strengths and weaknesses on, on digital infrastructure and trade infrastructure might be? And, and, and what some strategies for uh, picking up our game might be in those areas? Sure. I mean, I can just, you know, kind of tip of the iceberg kind of thing. And, uh, you know, there's there's some material on the uh, Lawrence National Center's website that uh, people could look at. Um, you know, digital infrastructure is high on the list of needs. It comes out in the, we come out ranking pretty low uh, in the OECD ranking. Uh, digitalization is uh, almost, think of it like a computer. It's a, it's a general purpose technology that will apply almost everywhere in the economy and, and it's so obviously productivity enhancing. Uh, but importantly, we've been trailing not just in, uh, in the development of, of a digital strategy or, or digital infrastructure, but also its use. So uh, we invest way less in technology per job than, we, than the uh, Americans do, for example. Uh, our cities use less smart infrastructure. There's incredible advances uh, going on in there like in terms of uh, electricity, lighting, water, water treatment, sewage treatment, all these things can be designed to be smart, save money, uh, all kinds of, and be better uh, in the end. Um, and uh, the use of digital uh, tools is heavily affected by location in Canada and by income. Um, so it's not just about connectivity, which is the first thing we think of. Oh, we need you know more availability of the high-speed internet. That's really important, it's for it's table stakes. But we also need to be uh, encouraging the development of applications. And then of course, on the end, the end user side, the adoption of digitalization. Um, so uh, the, on the trade side, also pretty high on the list, uh, it's a hot button issue right now, because of course, for the last few years, the last almost exactly four years, uh, we, we've been uh, in sort of uh, trade battles, if you like, uh, and the uh, tensions have risen between uh, the U.S. and China, and therefore between us and China. And there you have it. Our two uh, largest trading partners are, you know, kind of, you know, there's tensions there. Uh, so it just reveals that our trade dependence is so high on those two countries. And we could, we, we're, we're a natural trader, always have been. We, we could be a leader in the trade space, but we really aren't. Uh, we enter negotiations. Sometimes they take, uh, you know, entire careers to have these conversations. Uh, by the way, the very first thing we say when 
when we enter a negotiation about trade is we say, oh, by the way, don't even introduce the topic of supply management systems. We got to keep those. You know, we, we, we kind of start with the things we, we, we won't do as opposed to the things that we can do. Uh, we can't even achieve free trade between provinces. Uh, we think that would be worth over $100 billion of free income every single year. I mean, my goodness. Uh, why, why can't we do these things? Uh, so, uh, well, you know, that's why we had Confederation was to establish a free trade zone because the U.S. was cutting us off of trade back then. Uh, surely we can get the same, uh, same sentiment around the table in the situation we're in. Also should mention things like, well, social infrastructure, this kind of sounds like soft stuff, but it's not. Uh, my favorite example is daycare. Uh, what Quebec did for daycare system, I think is replicable across Canada with the right collaboration, federal provincially. And that is one of the key reasons why Quebec has the best fiscal situation across all the provinces because of higher labor force participation. So it's the kind of program that could pay for itself, literally. Uh, and importantly, one last thing is that, and this is something that the Lawrence Center has really emphasized, that none of these things is independent of the others. Each of those pillars is cross-dependent on the others. So you need to think of these things as a package or as a system. You can't have a really strong pillar and a tall pillar and have the other ones short shrifted because, you know, they won't hold up your, your growth strategy. Um, sometimes you get the impression that the, the events of the last year have uh, um, uh, left trade uh, with a bit of a bad reputation. This notion that we need uh, to depend on other countries for uh, equipment that in the crunch turned out to be vital here at home has led to pressure for deglobalization, reshoring, whatever you want to call it. Is that um, an inevitable future of our uh, an inevitable feature of our future, or is it uh, uh, an urge that should be resisted? Well, look, uh, it, it's it's uh, globalized, globalization is important to understand that globalization is not a, an either or proposition. It's it's more like a spectrum, and uh, where the point we find along that spectrum depends on things that are moving all the time. So it was never the case that we would just globalize right down to the down to the, the to the atom in the pro in the parts that we were uh, producing in Canada, uh, what would happen was we would find what globalization does is it finds the right match between the level of productivity of a worker somewhere in the world and the price that it costs to have them do that, and finds that for that piece in your collection of pieces that you call let's say your 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 smartphone, some of those pieces are easy to make, some of them are really really hard to make. And so you only want to pay a lot for the people to make the really hard parts and not the easy parts. Um, so if we brought everything back on shore, what we do is we, we eliminate all that optimization through the supply chain that people have, have done. Um, I've got a great story for you, Paul. I, I can remember like yesterday, my first color TV. Okay. That was, uh, we bought that in 1978. That was actually just after we arrived at Western. Uh, back in 19, the fall of 78. It was a beautiful 19 inch electro home color TV. And uh, I remember how much it cost because it was such a big deal for us, $549. Wow. Okay, well, you look on the Bank of Canada's you know, inflation calculator and that'll tell you that anything that cost $549 back then should cost around $2,000 today. Now that electro home TV was made in Kitchener. Okay, in Kitchener. It was made mostly from, by then, Japanese parts, JVC parts. But anyway, they used to make the tubes and everything in Kitchener. So anyway, today for $549, I can buy like a 60-inch TV, you know, that I can carry in one hand. It's so, you know, light and thin and everything like this. Uh, do we really want to reshore a business like that? Bring it back to Kitchener so that everybody has to pay $2,000 for a TV. You know, when people pay $550 for a TV, that leaves $1,500 other dollars for them to spend on all the other things that they want to buy. They have more income, more, more ability to spend. Well, this is, this is exactly what Trump did with kitchen appliances. He tried to reshore kitchen appliances. And the math on that is it added like $900 per year to every American family's budget. Not, not their spending power, but cost. 
And so, you know, maybe it created a few more jobs, but they were very, very expensive jobs from the general population's point of view. The point is, in, in trade, the trade allows you to focus on what you do best, you maximize it, and then you buy the rest. And that's what trade is. It's a tool to grow a sustainable business, and we've lost sight of that. Uh, if you forced me to reshore my business today, I think what I would do is just buy a bunch of robots, and I would make the product with robots. Okay, so uh, I probably wouldn't create any jobs. Um, people forget the head office jobs are the best paid jobs anyway, and that's why you want the company to be present. And uh, and the designers and the chief economist job, you know, the engineers, they're in head office. And then you have some of these manufacturing jobs that are somewhere else. Now, I know it makes it for adjustment problems for people in the manufacturing sector. I understand all that, but the progress means that we basically have a K all the time. Some people in the bottom part of the K, and, the, and that allows the top part of the K to grow faster. While we're talking about trade, uh, we might as well mention the elephant in the room or the elephant that's leaving the room, which is the, the, the uh, GOP president who's about to depart and the Democratic president who's about to arrive. Um, how much of what we're talking about will be affected by the policies of the incoming <clears throat> Biden administration? On, um, on, on trade versus protectionism, on uh, relations with China, and on human capital, because I think Canada, Canadian firms have had a fairly easy time attracting talent to the extent that American firms have been a little less uh, attractive lately. Is that going to change? Yeah. Well, those are all great questions and uh, very speculative. I don't have an authoritative answer for those, Paul, but, we, but let's at least think about the ingredients that would go in to thinking about that. Certainly, uh, I think an important uh, drag on, on business investment here in Canada for the last four years has been the uncertainty about the future that people have faced. I mean, right from the get-go, uh, NAFTA was going to get torn up, and we got into NAFTA negotiations, you know, and, and nobody knew how it was going to turn out. Imagine if your business relies on NAFTA. Uh, what that does to you, it means you're not going to make another investment until you have clarity. Or if you do, what a lot of people did was they thought, I better hedge my bets and I'm not gonna grow my factory here in Canada. I'm gonna grow my factory in the United States so that I can show that president that I'm, I'm, I've got an American operation too. So I'm not gonna run afoul and have tweets written about my, uh, about my company. So, so that's a very distortionary thing, very much uncertainty. So I expect there to be far less uncertainty of that type. OK, for starters. So I think that's an important positive. But fundamentally, uh, can we expect a dramatic change? I don't think so. I think that fundamentally, this, this concern about trade and, the, if you like, the, the discontent around who gets the gains from technology and from trade, that's a more deep problem. And it's more widespread and it's more fundamental than one politician. And I think uh, when you see uh, the incoming president talk about, you know, maintaining sort of buy America type policies or using filters about American companies, well, that's the same kind of sentiment that uh, he's tapping into. So we, I think that's the reality of our world today, that uh, we're in a bit of an ebb phase of globalization. People will need reconvincing about the benefits from trade, as I've just described to you. I mean, they need to understand that example with the TV set or the kitchen appliances to understand that actually it's not worth it for everybody in the economy to have to pay so much more for things uh, just to save or create a small number of jobs. There are better ways for people to grow into the top part of the K. And that would be by supporting those folks and helping them transition into the top part of the K uh, so they can participate in economic growth. That's an investment in people instead of an investment in a, you know, a false, a false uh, assurance uh, around, around a company. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, we can expect to have a more congenial kind of uh, relationship, but that's my first read. Uh, but I think uh, the reality is uh, those conditions, uh, many of the things that are still there uh, are going to be interfering. And I think one of the things we got to do, when I said we need to invest in our trade infrastructure, you know, no brainer to do inter interprovincial uh, trade liberalization. That's just free money that we refuse to pick up. 
But I think we need to be a little more aggressive about developing trade arrangements with other countries. If we look 10 years or 20 years in the future, uh, the, the biggest economies are going to be economies that are today look like emerging economies. And we need to make sure that we're part of that expansion. And you know, I'd almost, almost be willing to just say, well, here's our best template for trade agreement. Say it's the one that we have in the TPP, that, that, that trade agreement that we negotiated so hard. Let's make a Canadian standalone version of that and post it on the website and say that any country that would like to sign up to a trade agreement like that, word for word with, with us here in Canada is welcome. I mean, I think that we could get a long way with that kind of thing and uh, develop some new trade relationships uh, over time. I think that's an important investment that we could make. Hmm. Um, that does sound interesting. So basically, just put, hang out our shingle and say anyone who wants yep. to join. How many candidate countries? Sometimes I get the impression that we've signed free trade agreements with most of the interesting countries in the last several years. Yeah, we 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 have uh, you know we have agreements, but they're not free trade agreements. Okay, and they're not as um, as encompassing as the TPP ended up being. It's, it's a very strong agreement, well negotiated with, and those counterparties are great counterparties. And that that's that's a great great set of counterparties. Uh, but uh, but I think that uh, this would be more like I'm not I'm not willing to negotiate for five years or ten years. Just saying, like you say, hang up the shingle and say, like, we don't want to waste any time. We're interested in trading with you. And if these conditions look good to you, sign her up. And hmm. I think in that sort of situation, there would be takers. And there'd be that's a way of getting around the, the log jams that we have every time we try to do something multilateral or, you know, with, with the United States or, or others. It's, it's hard work, trade agreements, really, really hard work. And it's usually about what, what economists call the substitution effect. Well, will I make more of these things or less of these things? And if you make more of them, do I make less of them? When really what matters is the part I described before, which is the income effect. The fact that you get a TV for $500 instead of $2,000 means everybody has more spending power uh, than before the trade agreement. That's the most important benefit of trade and nobody even talks about it. It's all about the give and take of the trade agreement. So we've been talking a fair bit about extending the, um, increasing the total amount of uh, growth, making sure that it lasts. How do we make sure that it's inclusive? I've seen some fairly pressing questions from our viewers about the uh, dis disproportionate impact of the crisis on women, uh, the notion of a she-session, she uh, and, uh, and on people in the gig economy. How can we make sure that everyone benefits from this long-term growth? So I'm not I'm not an expert on this, but uh, you know there there are some I think fairly uh, fairly self-evident ideas that I've mentioned along the way. I mean, look, we we let's let's not get keep our perspective again. Here in Canada, we start from a much better place than lots of other countries. Certainly better than the United States in terms of inclusive growth. Okay, of course we are we are not perfect, but there's a world of difference between those two tax systems. Very very big differences. And they're, they're positive ones. Um, so we start there, but making sure that we repair the damage from this, from this pandemic, as you call it, a she session, uh, I think uh, daycare is probably the most important tool I can think of. And we should be serious about that, not just, oh, you know, let's encourage the development of this or that. I mean, it has to be a serious effort uh, to, to tap into. We have a growing workforce uh, of people who are, you know, in their in their 60s. So that's people like me, people who uh, would prefer semi-retirement to retirement, and we have all these young women with uh, with great qualifications that are self-teaching or, you know, uh, you know, trying to trying to manage things and not having access to enough daycare and, and affordable daycare. We can solve a huge problem by joining those things uh, together and doing it in a smart way. And it does not have to be costly fiscally because the extra growth it generates will help pay for it and, and easily could pay for it all. So that's a, a pillar of infrastructure, social infrastructure, which is really important uh, to this inclusive uh, nature of, of uh, your question. Uh, the pandemic has also laid bare some clear deficiencies in acute healthcare, 
um, continuing healthcare, you know, long-term care homes, where I think we, we really do need some significant investments also. And people say, these are just spending, but I don't think they are. The, these are investments, truly. Uh, the kinds of things that will, will prolong our growth trend and give us, give us um, actually the wherewithal to pay for the debt that we've just incurred. So those, those, are, those are my favorites on the inclusion front, Paul. We already have a good tax system. And I think, I think if, we're, uh, you know, if we were gonna really uh, fix it, uh, fix it, I should say that, if we were going to improve it, uh, it would be as like every economist, I think, I would rather see you know, us move more towards taxes on spending, like consumption taxes, which of course, the, the folks at the bottom end of the income scale get a, a GST rebate so that, that they're not uh, substantially harmed by that. Uh, but increase our taxes on, on spending and reduce our taxes on income and on, and on work in general. Uh, down in, in uh, New Zealand, they did that about uh, 30 years ago. And we always admire how the New Zealand economy recovers, how it grows. It's because of a really good tax reform they did 30 years ago. Hmm. Um, a lot of people watching are wondering about the future of the energy uh, sector. Um, um, it turns out that uh, a target of net zero carbon by 2050 actually starts to uh, produce quite pressing deadlines and, 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 and to uh, imply quite rapid changes in the structure of our energy use. Um, what are the implications on that for growth and for a healthy federation? Yeah. So I, th I think um, the the yeah, well, you know, the transition is is underway. Uh, that's absolutely right, and uh, and probably some more things will be done to make sure that uh, it progresses in a steady way. But I think we need to bear in mind that the demand for energy. Let's just not talk about what type, but the demand for energy is a really big number. We use it every day, all day, every day. And we hardly think about where it comes from, except when we drive our car, we, we stop at a gas station and we, and of course we know where that comes from. Uh, and so we immediately think of electric cars. That sounds like a great idea because that would mean I, was not, I would not be polluting while I drove. Well, energy uh, is not gonna, the demand for energy is not gonna go down. It's gonna continue to grow um, and it's gonna grow globally faster than it grows here in Canada, of course. And so my sense of it is that, uh, yes, uh, alternative sources of energy are gonna grow as a share of the total by handling the growth at the top. But fossil fuel energy is gonna continue to be the most important base of our energy needs until uh, a long time from now, even if we do the 2050 targets. Well, that what that tells you is that we'll be deploying all sorts of technology to manage the emissions that are that are created by that. And globally, just the switch from coal to natural gas can make an enormous difference to all that. We would have such a different outlook on that. And we would not be thinking about this, this deadline in the way uh, you are. So uh, I, for one, think that Canada's base, its energy supply, is going to continue to be very important uh, for the world. Uh, for as long as I can see ahead. Uh, but it will be of lesser and lesser importance in the big scheme of things because a lot of the growth will be in alternative forms. Um, that means that we have a base that matters. We need to be smart about it. We need to be the best in the world in terms of uh, producing it emissions-free and managing the, the, the downstream emissions as well. And uh, there's all kinds of technological uh, movement there that are going to help us to do that. So I'm quite optimistic on the energy uh, sector in Canada. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if anybody's watched Star Trek, you know that there's all kinds of stuff on Star Trek that's made out of plastic. And I mean, you gotta know that that's coming from the oil sands. It's not, they're not dilithium crystals. And and Lord knows there's always gonna be a new Star Trek uh, series. So that, that's- I, heard, I certainly hope so, Paul. That's a growth industry. Um, there's a question about, um, uh, opening up sectors of the economy to competition. 
uh, in banking with open finance or by relaxing the oligopolies in airlines and telecoms. I have to admit that's a, a, as a longtime employee of one of the big uh, oligopolies in telecoms, uh, this is a question that's dear to my heart. Is there room to um, uh, you know, unleash some competitive pressures in those sectors? Uh, well, there may be. I mean, it's uh, it all sounds good in theory, but uh, we we often forget just how small a place Canada really is in that big scheme of things. Um, so uh, it's, it's the kind of business where scale matters a great deal, uh, certainly in financial services and in telecommunication services and many other digital services. Uh, the more scale you have, the more there are benefits both to the company and to the consumer. Okay, so we and, and in of course, in terms of that growth line we talked about, scale matters a great deal in these businesses, much more than it did in the say in the 60s when we were fussed about about uh, the auto sector. You know, we, we we wanted to maintain our auto sector and we had the auto pact and all that. And, and, it, and it served, you know, Oshawa, my hometown uh, for most of my for most of my life. Well, OK. Uh, that, that's that's a whole different kind of business than the kinds you're mentioning now, which economists call natural oligopolies or natural monopolies, because scale makes them work so much better for everybody. And so we want to be careful just about how aggressive we are about these things, because the benefits may be uh, may become in a sort of a false premise, which is we get a lot of volatility, uh, you know, underperformance, and not as much growth as we hoped. So what we really look for, the usual Canadian solution is the optimal kind of combination of scale with regulation or, or you know, uh, you know, guidelines so that we so that we we get sort of a happy medium. We get the benefits of scale and we still get something out of the competitive side. I mean, these companies still have to compete for capital uh, for there. So there's an investor mechanism which makes them puts them under pressure if they're not competitive. Uh, so it's not as if they're, uh, they don't get competed against. So I'm not, I don't want to be categorical, Paul, because I'm all for competition. Okay. And, and I can see in the financial sector, uh, open banking is going to introduce a lot of uh, competitive forces. But in each one of those businesses, uh, people will discover quickly that scale makes it really good. And so it could end up being just, you know, another one of those things that gets bolted into the big system. And we feel more secure about it just because it's visible and it's not some no-name uh, competitor. It's, uh, it's a household name. We are getting quite close to the end of this session, but I do see uh, that um, there have been a, a fair number of questions about the effects of what we're doing now, which is, which is uh, you know, tele telecommuting, telecommunicating, yeah. and, and, and not having to gather someplace to make stuff happen. Um, a lot of people are wondering, is that going to have an effect on uh, the real estate market? Is it going to have an effect on public transit? Uh, or is it going to fade away? When, once we have the option to, 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 to be together, are we going to stop doing all this Zoom stuff? Yeah, I, I, think, I think in the last uh, few months, uh, we've all impressed ourselves with how much we're able to get done in this format. Uh, but I think we may be losing sight of of the fact that a lot of the growth that we were creating were actually synergy growth. They were based on interactions with people. And I think that'll become clearer the longer this goes on that we're actually lacking in, in some of the innovation and collaborative uh, parts of businesses. Uh, so I think the, the equilibrium that we see emerge is gonna be one where there's more flexibility in work arrangements but still a need to be getting together in person more frequently than we are in this setting. Uh, so that's that, but that just means that in the end, some of what you're seeing today is gonna end up being permanent. And as I said before, there'll be less stress on public transit, public infrastructure, uh, fewer cars going downtown and so on. I, I can certainly see that less business travel. I mean, would you travel to London every, every week to, to negotiate a deal for four weeks? Or would you do it this way and then just fly over at the last for the champagne? I mean, you want to be there for that part. So, so you know, maybe you can cut uh, business travel a fair bit. And so that's something that airlines will have to somehow deal with. And it's, it's going to be a hard adjustment process. Um, so some of it's permanent. I, I, I can assure you of that. 
But I would say, uh, don't forget that the, uh, the things that we have given up are real. And that will become clear uh, later. And if we don't do them, we won't achieve that growth track that you and I have been talking about mostly um, here. So the social interaction is an important component of growth. Uh, and we've got to, uh, we've got to uh, remind ourselves of that and make sure that we make it possible for companies to get back onto that track. Okay. Um, we could talk about this stuff all night. Uh, it feels like we've been talking about them for a year, uh, but uh, I, I, I think we really uh, got under the, the surface of some of these issues and got to some deeper conversation uh, on that. So uh, I, I think it's been worth our time. I want to thank you, Stephen Pelos, uh, who is um, uh, former governor of the Bank of Canada and more importantly, chair of the Lawrence National Center's uh, Advisory Council. And I'm Paul Wells, I'm a journalist, uh, and I'm a fellow at the Lawrence National Center. Uh, we very much appreciate everyone sticking around for this conversation. Uh, recording of this session will be emailed to all of you, so you can, you can uh, uh, cherish it always. Uh, and thanks, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>